Welcome to the Retreat Leaders Podcast, your sanctuary with retreat experts, where we spill the tea on retreat success. Here we dive into crafting transformational guest experiences, talk about how to avoid pitfalls, and unlock marketing secrets. Whether you're a seasoned guru or a budding enthusiast, we've got the inside scoop for you. Join us as we learn how to flourish in this magical world of retreats. Welcome to the Retreat Leaders Podcast, formerly the Happy Hour Podcast. This is Shannon. Listen, offering scholarship spots for retreats is a noble endeavor that not only broadens the accessibility of transformative experiences, but also enriches the retreat community by welcoming diverse participants. However, implementing a scholarship program comes with a set of challenges and considerations, from defining eligibility criteria to addressing potential obstacles. Today's show provides a detailed guide for retreat hosts on offering scholarship spots effectively. Let's get started. So first, you're going to want to establish the scholarship program in general. <laughs> Do you have one? Do you want to have one? Okay, let's just start there. If you don't even want to have one, you can skip this altogether. From day one, I knew I wanted a scholarship program for my retreats. And every one of my retreats has at least one attending guest on scholarship. But one of the first things you have to do once you've decided you want one is defining eligibility and the application process. Don't willy-nilly this. That can come back and bite you in the ass in so many different ways. So you really want to make sure you take the time to do this. If you're going to offer a scholarship spot, you want to clearly outline the eligibility criteria and the application process. You want to consider factors such as financial need, contribution to the community, or commitment to personal growth, or whatever fits your theme, retreat, personal choices, etc. You want to require applicants to submit a detailed form explaining why they wish to attend the retreat and how they plan to utilize the experience in their lives. By the way, this is all just my suggestions based on my experience and other hosts' experiences offering scholarships. It may look a little bit different for you. But by doing this, by clearly outlining this, the process, it not only helps in selecting deserving candidates, but also ensures applicants are genuinely interested. What you don't want is someone just to come on your retreat on a scholarship and be disruptive or not a good fit. And we talked about this in one of my previous podcasts on who is your ideal client. Your scholarship recipient should still also be your ideal client. They should be someone who you can serve, not someone who is someone that you just wouldn't want to work with or that wouldn't like what you have to offer. So this process helps do that. The next step is the selection criteria and maybe a panel. So what that means is you're going to want to determine who will choose the scholarship recipients. I do not choose my scholarship recipients. I have a board. I originally, they were my nonprofit board, but I closed down the nonprofit side of my business. And so they're still the same people, though. It's a selection of three people. They get all of the applications and they review it. And we, at the very beginning, set up criteria and they decide they vote. I have nothing to do with it. And I'll tell you why in just a moment. But this board or panel that decides could be you, it could be the retreat host or hosts, could be a committee of past participants, uh, collaborators, uh, really good friends and family that you trust. It could be past scholarship award winners even, or you know, eventually you would have that. But the selection criteria should be transparent and might include the applicant's demonstrated need, potential impact on their life, their commitment to the retreat ethos. Whatever it is that you feel is very important to your whole retreat goal. But establishing a diverse and unbiased selection panel can really help in making fair decisions. One of the reasons why I don't make the decision is many times I know some of the applicants. And of course, I'm going to be biased and want to lean towards the applicants that I know. Or maybe an applicant, I don't know, they their story or their information aligns more with me. But that doesn't mean that that should be the only reason why I choose them. That means I might look at the other ones as, well, their story doesn't align with my story the way this one does, so I'm just going to go with this one. And I would completely disregard everybody else's story. I don't want that. I want to take my personal biases or feelings out of it. And not to mention, I'm going to be the one there with them, which that poses a whole nother, you know, thing. I'd much rather a panel of people who will never meet them and can just objectively look at what are my goals, what am I looking for in a guest, and how do they fit and go from there and just take a vote. So anyway, so that's why I don't do it.
Shannon here, jumping in real quick to ask a question. Are you ready to transform your passion for retreats into a thriving success story? Of course you are. That's why you're here. Let me introduce the Retreat Leaders Playbook. I am biased, but is the ultimate guide crafted from over a decade of real life experiences by seasoned retreat hosts. This isn't just a book. It's a journey through the intricacies of creating, marketing, and selling out transformational retreats. With step-by-step guidance, the Retreat Leaders Playbook is your roadmap to a profitable retreat hosting experience. Whether you're new to the retreat scene or looking to elevate your hosting game, this playbook is designed for anyone aspiring to lead memorable and lucrative retreats. Navigate the retreat world with confidence, armed with proven strategies and insider knowledge. And there's more. If you love the playbook, you can apply the cost of the book towards our comprehensive course, packed with videos, templates, sample documents, and even workshop guides. It's everything you need to host with excellence and ease. Don't just take our word for it. Retreat leaders who've used the playbook are already seeing their retreats transform from vision to sold out sensations. Visit the retreatleadersplaybook.com to start your journey towards hosting success. The Retreat Leaders Playbook, where your retreat hosting journey begins and your dreams take flight. Learn more at theretreatleadersplaybook.com and turn your vision into reality. The next step is funding the scholarship. Listen, funding scholarships can be done in a various number of ways. It could include allocating a portion of every paid retreat spot revenue. It could be hosting fundraiser events. It could be seeking donations from sponsors who align with your retreat vision. Another approach is to offer a pay it forward option during the booking process, which allows participants to contribute to a scholarship fund. That's what I do. What kind of a combination? The first thing I do is every booking has the option to donate towards the scholarship fund. Then each month that I'm hosting a retreat, I look to see how much money is in the scholarship fund. If there's not enough in there to even cover one spot, well, then I make up the difference. But let's say there's some enough in there to cover one spot and even more. Then I have more and I invite more scholarships to attend. And so those are the ways that I do it. But I love the idea, too, of even doing fundraising events or seeking donations from sponsors. But whatever way feels right and aligned for you to do this. Let's talk about potential obstacles. The first one is the decision-making challenge. I mean, that's the biggest one, you guys, is essentially choosing among deserving candidates can be super emotionally taxing and logistically challenging, right? That's one of the reasons why I don't do it (laughs) myself. But one idea to navigate this is really setting clear objective criteria before reviewing the applications and stick to them throughout the selection process. Y'all, honestly, if it was up to me, every single one that comes through would just get a spot and then I would never have any money to feed my family. (laughs) Like I would be running a nonprofit in the negative. And so that's why it's super important to have some objective, unbiased thoughts, in my opinion. But you might be one who can totally do this, who can do this without emotionally being involved and really being able to compartmentalize your thoughts, feelings, etc. So anyways, but the other thing you could do too is consider having a wait list of candidates in case your chosen applicant cannot attend, because that can happen often. And also have a timeline of selection and accepting, including cancellations. So, you know, let's say you have a retreat starting six months from now. Maybe you accept applications for the retreat scholarship until 60 days before so that you can give the recipient plenty of time to make plans to attend the retreat on the scholarship. And so that would be ideal, no less than 30 days before the retreat, but 60 days is a good amount of time for someone to be able to make plans, childcare, whatever needs to be done. The second issue that can come up is getting real commitment from the scholarship recipients. So it's a common concern that scholarship recipients might not value the opportunity as much as paying participants. This is a truth, and I know it's hard to hear. But when there's no quote unquote teeth in the game, it's so easy for them to just last minute cancel and back out and they've lost nothing, but you have, and another potential scholarship person has, because then you're scrambling and you're trying to find like another recipient who could take their spot. And so this is really, really probably the hardest part for me is when we've awarded a scholarship and then they just cancel and we understand things come up. Anybody could cancel, but this more often than not for people who 
don't pay anything, whether it's scholarship or even just a free attendee in general. It could be a friend of yours even. So that's something that you really want to make sure that you know that that's, you know, that's an option. One way to mitigate it is maybe consider requiring a nominal fee, which can even be refunded after completing the retreat or ask for a written agreement, outlining the commitment to intend and engage fully. I highly recommend this anyway, because the other thing is what happens is when someone isn't financially committed and they show up, they kind of do their own thing sometimes and they're not participating in the retreat itself. And so maybe if that's part of your requirement, having that in there, the donation that they could pay to or a nominal fee, it could either be refunded to them or donated to their charity of choice at the completion of the retreat as well. All right, let's talk about benefits and even additional considerations. Some benefits, community impact. I mean, offering scholarships can significantly impact your community. It really does create opportunities for those who might benefit the most, but can afford it the least, right? Marketing and funding, you know, highlighting your scholarship program and your marketing materials can not only attract a wider audience, but also inspire donations and sponsorships. It's a really great way also, and this is the sticky side of business where your first thing should be leading with your heart why you're doing this. But a good benefit secondary is PR. I mean, it does get you some PR and marketing recognition in certain areas and in certain ways. And then think about post-retreat engagement, encouraging scholarship recipients to share their experiences through testimonials, social media posts, however, videos, whatever it is that resonates with you and the scholarship recipient. Because this not only provides them with a platform to share their journey, but also serves as a powerful marketing content for your retreat, right? So anyway, all that to be said is incorporating scholarship spots into your retreat really can be a rewarding strategy on so many levels. It expands access to those who can benefit from the experience the most, but it does present certain logistical and financial challenges. The potential to change lives and build a more inclusive community is immense. It's worth it, in other words. At least I feel like it is. <laughs> but by carefully planning the scholarship program, from application to funding to selection, you really are ensuring a positive impact, not just on the recipients, but really the entire retreat ecosystem. So it's really something to consider implementing into your programs. So I'd love to hear from you if this is something you've done or want to do or your challenges and your rewards from it. And as always, I look forward to talking to y'all next week. Here's to a successful retreat hosting week. Thanks for listening to the Retreat Leaders Podcast. Learn more at www.theretreatranch.com. See you next time.